Hello, hey, this is David D. Hilster, and um, I am here with my live chat Friday evenings. As you know, I'm a critical thinker and dissident scientist, and uh, I see people, I'm getting the hang of this now. You can see I did it my event ahead of time, and it had a countdown and everything. I finally figured that out. <laughs> a computer person finally figuring out something that lots of other people already know. But um, tonight I'm going to be talking about dissidents in general. So, um, oh, I see people have some people have already been here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I see on the chat over here. And again, I'm going to be talking about uh, someone. Some people are wanting me to talk about Ken Wheeler. I did take a look at his work, and I'll be mentioned talking about that. Some really interesting stuff there. Ken has been been doing. Uh, actually, something I've never really seen before. But um, uh, I will talk about what that is. But I'm going to also talk in general because I had a really hard time. Because if I were to go through, uh, for instance, his video like I did with his, his website, you know, uh, use my critical thinking. I I don't want to spend time. Uh, how do you say? I don't want. It, it does it's not very productive for me necessarily to go through and talk about uh, all the details in the way um, the way he's talking what he's talking about um, his conclusions and all those kinds of things and that got me thinking and the last half an hour I've been thinking all week actually how do I go about this because I don't want to be uh, just you know disingenuously uh, supportive. I don't want to be disingenuously um, uh, critical is either, and it really got me thought, thinking about um, basically some uh, things about dissidents and our community that we're in. Uh, when I look around our community, our dissident community, uh, not so much. Well, even amongst ourselves in the CMPS, the CMPS. What is that? That's the organization that was started in the early 1990s by uh, Dr. J John Chappelle. Uh, he started the Natural Philosophy Alliance. Basically, natural philosophy is the name of physics before we gave it the modern name physics. So, in the, for instance, the 19th century, what physicists were doing was called natural philosophy, the philosophy of nature, the rules of nature, the laws of nature, the, our idea of trying to find the systems in nature. And so um, that group uh, started getting together in 1993, I believe, or yeah, I think so, and met almost every um, uh, everybody, every person, uh, basically all the people who got together uh, and, and that organization uh, really started hashing it out. They started meeting and talking about things and debating about things. And I'm going to talk about that because uh, there's one thing that over the years I got involved in 1996, three years later, I uh, was in and out of it, but I did follow it uh, for many years. I didn't go to all the conferences. And then starting in 2000, uh, mid 2000s, I started going more. I think 2004, 2005, I started going. I, I'm not really sure. I have to check the database, go to DB dot natural philosophy.org but regardless it got me thinking in today's we've got a numerous people not a lot but numerous people who are doing channels now who are dissidents or who are critical thinkers or who are people challenging the mainstream and there seems to be a lot of dissidents among the dissidents um people who say no i subscribe to this guy well, I, I i i subscribe to that guy and that's one of the things um uh, I think, like I said, got me thinking. And I came, when I started this channel, I also thought to myself, well, I disagree with a lot of stuff that people outside the mainstream are doing. And I'm used to doing that. And I'm used to being in a group where we can easily disagree, but we still help each other. We still talk to each other. We still make criticisms to make ourselves better. If we find a weakness in someone's argument, we try to point that out, but we don't do it in a harmful way. Well, not always. <laughs> and um, when I, again, when I started this channel, 
I looked at the Electric Universe, which has a big following and have been around for quite a while doing a lot of work, uh, doing some uh, pretty heavy experimental work with the Sapphire Project. I think there's probably millions of dollars being invested in that. And, uh, and they do conferences that are well organized, well produced, those kinds of things. And they got over 100,000 uh, subscribers and continue to grow. Of course, they've been around and doing this a while. Uh, if we would have been doing this a while and had those kinds of productions, you know, we could have been further along as well. But it made me think, okay, what is it that I have to do so I make this channel so it's not biased? Um, uh, in the sense of trying to support everybody outside the mainstream who's doing work. And that's what I've been trying to do. So when I, when I review somebody, even like Ken Wheeler, I look at, okay, what, what's, what's, uh, you know, what, what's he saying that's really interesting? And he does. He has a super interesting uh, physical experiment that he does with uh, LEDs and light and mag magnetism. And uh, absolutely fascinating. I've never seen it before. <sighs> I'm sorry. I've been trying to. I'm wanting to yawn. Now everybody's going to yawn. But uh, <laughs> but anyways, I see the comments. I appreciate everybody coming on. But uh, I will. I'm going to start talking since we got uh, some viewers here now. Uh, I'm going to start talking a little bit about um, what I've come in the conclusion to this before I go in and start looking at Ken's stuff. I want to lay some groundwork as to what I think as a person who's really pushing for the idea that we all outside the mainstream have to work together. But not only that, this is the way science should work. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to show you, this is the way science should be all the time. And what the CMPS does, that's the way, that's why uh, on the Science Woke uh, website which I'm working feverishly on this week uh, is ending a week of my vacation and I spent half that time working on science woke getting that um, website ready programming writing uh, reorganizing but one of the things is is that I have one of the articles that say the CMPS is the best scientific organization in the world and it is and the reason it is is because we allow dissident um, um, arguments. We allow anybody to criticize anything as long as it's scientific. It's done in a organized and scientific manner. Manner. We don't care about your title. Uh, and today, in age with the internet, that means less and less and less. I mean, uh, uh, how many people dropped out of computer science to start billion-dollar companies? Uh, those kinds of things. Well, anyways, let me get on to it, get on with it before people start going away, like, Dave, say something here. So here we go. Let's start uh, with my pre-talk before I start talking about, like, Ken Wheeler and other people here. So these are dissident grand mistakes or the grand mistakes of dissidents. Um, one of the things I see with people outside the mainstream, they have the attitude that they know they are right and every up, everyone else is wrong. And... If there's any way to turn people off to what you're doing is is to give people that attitude. I think you need to be excited about what you're doing. For sure, my father and I are excited about what we're doing. But we're going to be the first to tell you, we could be off our rockers. Our, our theory could be just, I mean, it could be just a joke. Uh, we don't think so because we're still working on it. But but if you ask me and pin me against the wall, says. Hey Dave, is your dad dad and your um, theory the correct one? No, is it a good one? It's pretty good, but it's the correct one. No, could another theory that that we know about today end up being the correct one? Yep. Um, so this whole attitude of no, you are right and everyone else is wrong. It's not that I will not support what you're doing. It's that you're shooting yourself in, in the head. The other one is sounding sort of religious-like and less scientific. You know, um, you know, vocabulary, speak, 
lingo, um, that kind of thing. Uh, I know that I, I don't, I'm not going to name people, but I want you guys to watch these different uh, groups, different individuals, and look for that. I mean, when my, my father's talking about stuff, you don't hear him, you know, talking about it in some mystical way, in some, um, you know, way that you're, you're, you're actually worshiping as you talk about it. You talk about it in a sort of awe. You're talking about something bigger, like you found nirvana or something. And so that's another thing that I would say some of the grand mistakes that dissidents have. Um, of course, mainstream has these same problems too, but I'm not, I'm not interested in them right now. Just talking about we dissidents. Um, the other thing is uh, that we, that is done is those that, uh, that, those that say there is only one truth. I've heard that um, by a number of people, one may be more specifically than another than other people or groups, and that is the universe has one truth, and we must go. For the, we will discover it. Uh, the rules we will discover, and once we discover those rules, it's right. Everybody else is wrong. That's it. And you know, that's just not the way to look at it. Because when you say there's only one truth. What that means is if somebody comes with a better model and you don't agree with it, well, whose truth is right? Uh, so if you have this attitude, I'm just telling all my subscribers, if you want to be science woke, if you want to be a critical thinker, uh, you have to be, get this notion that there isn't, no, there's not one truth. There can be a consensus of what we think is the best of something that we can do that's all we can do really so if you hear people saying you know hey there's only one truth and I found it or um, there's only one truth and I'm trying to find it and that means the idea that you could have six different um, models of the universe and they could live in harmony that's that's ludicrous it's not ludicrous but that's a different that's this is when you get into talking about the philosophy of science natural philosophy and then uh, my fourth bullet point i said those that spend time tearing down others working outside the mainstream that is what good does that do um the only time you do that normally is when you're threatened and the threat doesn't necessarily come because the person you're talking about in your video and tearing down is be, uh, is is that their arguments threaten your model from most of the people I've seen online who are those people who tear down and this other people and I've got videos out there doing that to me <laughs> I don't care actually they bring more people to me because people come to me and they go hey he's not that way I kind of like that Dave's pretty cool um, so I've actually, when those videos come out, it's really strange. Uh, my, my subscribers were, were for me going through the roof. I mean, I usually I get two or three a day and they were going up to five, six, 10, you know, a day for a little period. I was going, what's going on? And, and find out that somebody was like lambasting me and, and they were coming away like, Oh, subscribe this guy. Not too bad. But if, you, those, if you're spending time tearing uh, th others' work down, it's really out of fear. And that fear usually comes without your, when they, people do that, it comes from the fact that they don't, they look at something, they make some superficial judgment on it, and then try to argue against it that's anything that may tear down your idea. And that's just, that's the wrong way to go about science. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't even really matter. Uh, about whether or not uh, that person's right or you're right or they're wrong. It's just not the way to go about it. I mean, I always look at everything, including Ken Wheeler's stuff. Mm -hmm. I see it as a chance for uh, people and myself and others to see the world in a different way that maybe inspire me from what I'm working on uh, or, or whatever, or to discover new directions, uh, new connections in my brain about the universe. You know, so 
you know, tearing other people's work down by saying this is bad. So they're tearing about the work. But then, then of course, the last one's just name calling. I mean, you know, when I talk about the mainstream and they're talking and they have these articles come out um, because I'm on vacation, I'm putting out more videos. And I already got some videos lined up. I just have recorded them. I've got all my notes there. But, you know, I take some of these these um, mainstream articles thinking, oh, my gosh, maybe we made a breakthrough in something. And these guys are literally talking about stuff that are so far out that if you have any type of engineering or critical thinking or uh, your science woke in any way, these people are off their rocker. And I'm not talking about I'm not calling them idiots. I'm not calling them, you know, uh, insane. Uh, most of the time, all I say is they must do a lot of mushrooms or something. They must do some, maybe drugs. That's what I'll say. Why? Because I can't see how lucid people are believing what there com comes out of their mouth and then they write it down and then they publish it. But you never hear me uh, calling them idiots. You know, um, uh, the people I actually get really upset with are the science evangelists, uh, especially Neil deGrasse Tyson, those guys. He's sort of backed off. But these guys are, you know, egomaniacs. And I, I that's when... You know, Dave gets close to calling name, but I don't. I just, you know, there's, there's no reason to. But people do. You hear name calling. I'm going to show you, you know, name calling on the, <laughs> they're in their titles. Go search for dissident and something and you're going to see people, you know, they do it with me as well. Okay, slide one. All right. Slide two, consensus is last, not first. Now, I did a video, actually. If you look at like, consensus is, I don't know, I'm going to say it before without, without me knowing it. Um, consensus is wrong, I think, is, is if you look up, let's see, consensus is wrong. Let's see if you come up with, uh, my videos come up here. Yep, there it comes up. Wow, actually, there's quite a few of them. I mean... I did this in 2012 in Albuquerque. It's definitely worth looking at. My gosh, I got 15 uh, and I got a, eight, almost a thousand um, views of this. I think it was on there actually before and I had to move it, but um, I'll, I'll show you this. Um, let's see here. There we go. Um, MPA Natural Philosophy Alliance, the 19th Annual Conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico. This was on August 12th. Uh, 2012 that's Greg Volk and uh, it was a really interesting talk in fact um, for our channel <laughs> um, this was uh, we didn't really have any editing we just had one camera and um, I talked about this uh, got quite a lot of comments and a lot of people uh, um, who linked to it but uh, it's something that I've talked about anyways so consensus take a look at that um, and uh, oh, there's the uh, title. You can see that now. Consensus in science is wrong. Uh, so you know me. I'm just like a rabble rouser. Uh, but regardless, um, mainstream looks for consensus. In fact, Wikipedia is the the sad case, the best example of that. And anytime you try to put any alternative ideas in physics there, you're immediately la labeled pseudoscience. They should l label it as, you know, new models or new ideas or uh, alternative models. They should not be labeled um, negatively, but they do. Uh, so mainstream looks for science and, and uh, they should say they look for consensus and dissidence and say it's non-existent. Uh, its non-existence is reason to dismiss them. If you look, watch my um, video uh, that I just showed you, I do talk about this. Basically, they use this and say, look, if you guys have a, gr a better model, everybody should be uh, supporting it because you found a better model. If you have a thousand people with a thousand models, you haven't found anything and you're all lost. Uh, that's what they'll say. Uh, so they, they, they think that consensus in science is important. They use it for themselves and they use it uh, in, to bully people and they use it against we dissidents by saying, oh, you know, we don't agree on anything. We have a thousand different ideas. Consensus comes through the cooperation and understanding of everybody's point of view. So consensus does happen and will happen in the some sense. People will gravitate to better ideas and things that work. And we, 
we have those things in our in the CMPS, but it only happens when you get together and, and cooperate. And that's why we have like our conferences and those things and our proceedings to get together and, and do exactly that. So let me uh, go here before I keep going here. Religion, like God, uh, you know, I talk about everything. We only progress when discover, uh, we discover mistakes and know what is not correct. That's uh, erratic. True, but unfortunately, we say that all the time, but we do it very little, especially when it comes to our own ideas. If I've noticed with people who even don't have their own ideas, they say, I subscribe, uh, like uh, Lisa. Lisa's not here tonight. She's probably busy. Uh, she's usually here. Uh, she says, I sort of subscribe to Elect Electrical Universe. I said, and my answer to that, Lisa, it would be, don't subscribe. Just say, I'm le maybe leaning toward it, but you have to understand what the problem today is, is now that we have the internet, you can't just, if you learn about one and you like it, that's great, but then you hear about others, you've got to keep watching everything that comes up. When Ken Wheeler, when I saw his stuff, I've never seen it before, it comes up, take a look at it. Maybe this guy has discovered it. I always think, well, maybe somebody has that it, you know, because I'm, even though I'm working with an it with my father. Ken Wheeler gets inspiration from Tesla, who got inspiration from Robert uh, uh, Boschkovich, yeah, um, uh, who got inspiration from the Greeks. Yes. Oh, even so, even if blah, 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 found a huge issue with plan that hi highlight issue in huge amount of field of physics and science, he'll get ignored because he doesn't supply a model. Could be. All right, just making sure I, I uh, keep up with you guys. I appreciate it. Um, so that's about consensus. I got just two more slides. And um, here, here's, here's what my conclusion is. And, um, and this includes everybody who's doing a web, uh, you know, a YouTube channel. Ken Wheeler included. All the other people included. My father, um, uh, Jeff Yee, um, uh, everybody, uh, Electric Universe, and they don't all do this. And I am not, you know, first of all, for anybody to take on mainstream and be pu public about it, I have too much respect for that, that part of it to get mad. I get frustrated more than anything. And I think those people who do unite are the ones, well, it's, it's a fact. Those people who do unite are the ones who are going to push science forward. You know, doing it in isolation and then coming up with it, like the surfer dude with the 256 um, dimensions or whatever, circle, whatever he has uh, to unite all the forces and all that stuff, it ain't happening anymore. You got to really work together. Everybody works uh, together and not in isolation. Even Einstein, who claimed he didn't know about Michael Mickelson and Morley and all those. Come on. He's not that he he knew about it. Uh, this idea that you come out of the blue, some genius, some savior. It's just not going to happen. So fighting mainstream with a fractured community is impossible. It really is. Um, if we do not. And it, well, we'll see. We must support each other's right to challenge the mainstream. We must support that first and foremost. Um, I applaud Ken Wheeler. Absolutely. The guy's got what? A lot of followers. My goodness. Um, how many people he's got? 100,000? Uh, I don't know. Quite a few. Um, how many people are subscribed to him? Yeah, he's got 150,000. You know, he's been around, of course, since 2011. 2012 so that's been six years been around less than two but yeah he has some following and uh, that's quite uh, quite uh, amazing so um, great for him but we need to support each other's work and like I said people are bashing each other. I want to show you people bashing Ken Wheeler um, we must support each other's right to argue their point um, you know that's one of the things too is we don't even let a person argue their point even like in global warming you know maybe two-thirds of the studies maybe sh somewhat support the idea and then one-third don't 
uh, and some of the ones that support global warming are bad science. Some of the ones that uh, say it's not good is bad science and vice versa. Some of that says there's not is good science as well. We have to debate this out. I'm not here to tell anyone here my stand on global warming. I, I go for more destruction of the earth. I don't care. You know, whatever it is, uh, we're destroying the planet and that's a fact. And, um, uh, you know, uh, we're doing it for not just from our cars, but from our even our diets are doing worse. No one talks about that. So I have my own opinions on that. But it's the idea is we got to let people argue their points. If you're a liberal or a progressive and you say global warming is 99.99% for certain, you're wrong. It's a consensus right now, but nothing's ever certain. Nothing's ever proven. We have support for stuff and the support may show a great support for it. But I'm not here to argue that because it's not my area of specialty. So I don't read uh, about that. But my point is not even that. The point is that we need to uh, support each other's right to argue their point. Let me argue my point. And when you do, then you listen to other people's, you know, sometimes that's not what even people do. Where, where you're at a video conference on every Saturday morning, the CMPS has a video conference at 10 a.m. Eastern time, 7 a.m. Pacific time for two hours. And a person sp speaks and is a video conference, so everybody has a voice, audio, and you can even have video. It holds up, I don't know, lots of video. So you can have like bunches of video chats. It's infused. Check it out. Um, just go to naturalphilosophy.org. In fact, there's a couple coming up. You can see, I think, Lori Gardee is going to be talking on light tomorrow morning. And also, um, Jeff, he's going to be talking about his stuff. I've been trying to get him to do that. And, and what happens, a lot of people go in there. I don't believe anything this person's saying, but I'm going to sit around and in the chat, or I'm going to sit around and then when it comes to my turn, I'm going to tell a person how they're wrong, but then I don't listen to what the person says back to me. All I'm doing is going in, to do, poking in it, poking you, and saying, hey, you're wrong because of this. And then maybe I go into a tirade about how I'm right. And then when someone makes any comment, you don't, you don't comment. It's just totally useless. It's, it's absolutely useless. It just annoys everybody. So the idea is, if you cannot listen to someone else's argument that comes back, then you're wrong. If you hear the argument coming back, and the person is just playing the same key on the piano, and that key on the piano, in, a, in, in your mind, is just off, wrong key, then okay, that's cool. But you got to let that back and forth and everybody has to listen to the, the argument counter argument counter counter argument etc we must do we must not dismiss, dismiss something because we have sided with something or someone or some theory or someone well i sort of subscribe to the electric universe oh i sort of subscribe to ether and so you know i'm just not no folks Here's what's going to happen. While you're subscribing to Ether, some other model is going to be going gangbusters and you're going to be like, oh, I'm left behind. Or if you're subscribed to um, the particle model like ours and then the, someone in the Ether world comes up with something that's like, is just going gangbusters. Eh, well, you know, I, I, I subscribe more to Dave and the De Hilsters model. You're in trouble. It's just, it's just going to say, as I say to everybody who has a theory, if if you don't question your own stuff, you don't question even your own subscribing to something, someone else will find the mistake, correct it, make a better model, and move on, and you'll be left in the dust. You'll either be left in the dust as a subscriber or left in the dust as a person trying to come up with better models. That's just, I'm not telling, this is the way it works. This is the way the world works. All right, my last slide. It will all shake out. You know, it's like, Dave, you're just telling us all the, what was I telling you? We must unite. Okay, that's great. But what's going to happen? You mean we'll never get to something? There's always going to be, no, it will all shake out. Good ideas will be copied or agreed upon. Bad ideas will die. This will only happen when we work together. How can, how can good ideas be copied if we're not working together? How can bad ideas die if no, because no one's using them? Right now, if everybody's isolated, no one cooperates, they're all dead. They're all dead. 
and this will only happen if we meet and discuss and debate and challenge. And the last thing, change. I remember the guy that my dad's helping write a book, uh, he's an etherist, and I gave a talk about um, uh, the tree, neutrino. Uh, the neutrino doesn't exist, and I gave all my arguments for it. My, my arguments, most of them are Karazani's arguments. But, you know, you you pick up on it. And um, the guy came up to me right before the cycle. I wish I would have seen your talk ahead of time. I would have uh, uh, adjusted my model because, you know, I'm trying to model what's there. And he's right. Um, doesn't mean, I'm not saying he's, I'm right, that the neutrino doesn't exist. Although, um, I think there's a lot of people who have that uh, opinion these days. Uh, and I'm not right because, uh, that he, he's not right because he has to change. The idea is that you gotta keep your eyes wide open. You have to stay science woke. Or... You'll be left behind. So that's that's the kind of thing I came up with before. I'm going to talk about Ken Wheeler. And this will put things into perspective, I think, and get you to understand my perspective so that when I make a criticism about Ken or anybody else, you understand that, first of all, he is a hero to me, first and foremost, because he is out there trying to come up with new ideas and a new model and a new way to look at the universe. <laughs> I can't, I can't, dis, I can't um, talk bad about him. I can't call him a name. I can't say he's crazy. I can't say he's stupid. I can't say he's off his rocker. I can't say any of that. I have to say congratulations. Not only do you have an idea, you got 150,000 people around the world liking what you're talking about. Now, do I have criticism? Absolutely. But it's not a criticism uh, in the case that, like, stop what you're doing. Ken, you're terrible. Everybody should subscribe to my model. No. It's, it's pointing out stuff I've learned, and that's why I'm sort of doing this channel, is to look at the meta ideas, the big ideas of everything. So, so I hope this will put things in perspective. You just got here. I'll try to couch what I'm talking about in my points again, okay? Uh, the points where the big mistakes, knowing that everything you sound religious-like, you uh, there's only one truth, spend time tearing out others, name-calling, not good consensus, the mainstream looks for it, uh, they say we dissidents uh, don't have it, therefore we shouldn't be look at it, but consensus only comes through the co cooperation. We, we gotta unite fighting mainstream we're uh, uh, with that with a fractured community it ain't gonna help isn't gonna isn't gonna do anybody any good we can't do that we got to support each other got to support each other right to argue and we we must not uh, dismiss something because we've sided with one side and then we get territorial and of course it will all shake out but it'll only happen when we work together and we are willing to change when we find we're wrong when we say, you know, that that's true, that's that's not good. I got I got to think about that, or I have to admit that's a problem with my idea. And if you if you are that with if you have this engineering attitude, that's great. I'll give in 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 the film in, in the film I, I talk about my anxiety with um, uh, my father who presented our work on the gravity uh, graviton uh, detecting experiment as proposed by Dr. Karazani. The truth of the matter is the way we were making it had zero chance of working. But what it ended up doing was getting us to think about the world the way Karazani did and my dad to come up with equations uh, that actually used gravitons and all the little forces and came up with a curve that, f that fit Newton and he was so curious. So it, it, it led to something good. It doesn't mean it, uh, a failed or a flawed, which it was, a flawed experiment not because of Karazani, but because of the way we implemented. But regardless, we did that, and I knew that, and my dad was going to this, the MPA in 2006 or 2007 to present, and um, I felt really embarrassed. I thought, oh my gosh, he's gonna get up there. He's the first time he was ever there. People are gonna wail on him, and they did. Um, and someone raised his hand, you know, uh, Bob DeHilster, 
you know you've got in your in in your experiment and in your model you've got this this and this and this wrong uh, these are real problems you may want to take a look at that and I'm looking right and, and I, I thought to my dad he's like gonna melt he's never gonna want to come back He's saying, Dave, what did you get me into the, this in the film? Because I'm, got, I'm the one who got him into this. You know what he said? He just blew me off. He blew me away. And I, I had an immense respect for my father at that moment. And what, was the, what, what did he say? He goes, oh, you think that's bad? Let me tell you three bigger problems and then went to proceed to talk about three huge problems that he saw with his own work. I had an absolute um, ad admiration for my father at that point. And the reason is, is because he has, and what I have is the same thing as an engineering attitude that nobody's theory, nobody's ideas, nobody's equations, nobody's, Newton's, nobody's, is anything but our feeble attempt to put a, a, mathema a flawed mathematical system, which real numbers are. we got to change that even. we got square root of negative one, can't divide by zero. It's our system. It has nothing to do with the universe. Dividing by zero doesn't exist in the universe. So it's our, we're using flawed mathematical system to try to come up with ways to model the universe. And we've been successful. Newton's probably the most successful equations that have come out of physics. Because look at all the things. We go to the moon. We go everywhere with them. We don't use relativity at all. And so that attitude of that, well, we've got, this is what we got. It, it, it ain't great, but, you know, it's what we got. And you don't you have zero marriage to it that's the way nasa engineers were when they had went to the gemini uh, uh mercury mercury gemini and apollo missions those guys they were like you know i don't care what you're dreaming about i don't care give me the equation does it work and then you came up with some idea like oh i've got this idea to save apollo 13 and they can like just you know they're looking at you like you're nuts you got something for real and it doesn't have to be super difficult, so uh, that sort of uh, av uh, that sort of engineering attitude. Uh, anyways, that that's something we all have to have, in my opinion. Alrighty, so let me uh, go and talk about Ken Wheeler a little bit. Um, uh, that's why I promised to talk about. And the first thing I want to talk about is not even Ken Wheeler, but other people talking about Ken Wheeler. And remember, I was talking to you about, now, I'm not sure if these people who are talking to him are mainstream lovers or tree huggers, uh, the, the tree being the, you know, mainstream physics. But look at this. Um, Ken Wheeler, the lying, thieving, plagiari plagiarizing parrot. This is, this, this is what, when people come to people who have really maybe great ideas and great you know this guy came up he's got a an experimental setup that's fantastic um i was you know i'm using my model to try to figure out really what he's showing you know his explanation is his explanation but i think this is really cool has he found something new has he not is this explainable is this something revolutionary is the system he's talking about doesn't matter he's out there and he's trying it and he's got people following and listening to him um you know it's just let's see remember that sick ass net like oh i don't know let's see um anyways that that you can you can you can see but when i look at his um website uh i guess it's theory of ap uh, apophysis i don't know if he's here he is here, Ken. Congratulations on your website. And you have 54 million views. That's pretty awesome. I got like 70,000. Oh my goodness. This guy's. But I got. I guess he is in the um, photography area. Uh, does photography. Oh, he can't talk about physics. You know, you know what I do after eight years? If you watch my uh, movie online, if you see the video that I just dropped today... Uh, about my uh, dear friend and colleague um, uh, Jeff Hunter, who passed away this week, 
who was in my film. Um, go to that video and you can actually watch uh, uh, my uh, documentary. And uh, you can uh, uh, see there at the end of the documentary, I came up with, uh, I had to come up with my one phrase that I learned after eight some years filming this thing. And I came up with this phrase. It took me that many years, eight or nine years. And that is, don't listen to me, listen to what I say. And what that means is, I don't care what your title is. I'm listening to what you're saying. I don't care. I didn't even know what he was. I didn't know if he was a physicist or if he was a photographer. I don't. I think he's a, maybe a software guy, like me. Who cares? I'm listening to what he's saying. So, um, you know, congratulations. You know, in six years to have that many views and that many subscribers, that's pretty amazing. Um, and he does videos. Uh, let's see if he has on his home. Uh, this here is a picture of an experiment he does. Now, if I can maybe get get the uh, video. If anybody of you know which video I should look at, that would be the video that explains his well, magnetics, maybe. Well, look at that. 60,000. He just went up this. Whoa. It's not from my subscribers. Oh, yeah, everybody watching my channel right now live has subscribed to him. Well, maybe he has, but um, somebody can put uh, his say magnetics. There we go. And uh, I think he talks about the magnets. Let me see here. Two images explains. Okay. Yeah, he, he, he basically, let's see if we can. Uh, sorry, I'm not more prepared on this. Okay. Let me see. I don't have the sound on. Okay, I think this is where he just explains the apparatus, and I think this is really worth looking at. Um, I'm going to mute me and get him. And that you've never seen before. I'm going to use a regular flashlight. It doesn't have to be a powerful one. It can be even a low-power uh, LED light. Now let me go grab a low-power LED light since I didn't grab one before. And I'll make it red colored, okay? It's a very low powered LED light. So before I turn the lights off, here it is right here. Now what you're going to see is you're actually going to see the magnetism skewing, just skimming the top of the ferrule cell. Okay, the magnet, uh, the lighting isn't on the edge of the ferrule cell at all. It can't hit that since it's underneath uh, the casing. It's just skimming there, and you can actually see the uh, magnetic wake front. See there? This is just from a super low power LED, so. Now the 3D, no, it jumped right there because there's a battery in there. <laughs> but let me show you with uh, the, uh, the flashlight, just skimming the surface here. You see the wake front that looks like a smiley face right here? I'm just skimming the surface with a flashlight. But the magnetism is penetrating the uh, field flux of the centrifugal hyperboloid, the reciprocating processional hyperboloid that defines the spatial counterspatial geometry of centrifugal divergence and centripetal convergence, is showing up regardless. So it, I don't even have to. Okay, I did want to make a point right there. First of all, this is a fascinating experiment. This is just was blowing my mind at the time when he was showing to me. I was wasn't listening so much to what he was saying. I was just watching what was happening and, and how and, and he, what he was saying. But then when you get into what he was saying, you know, I, for anybody who doesn't know, I've got my Bachelor of Science in Mathematics. I love mathematics, um, advanced calculus. Uh, so mathematics, systems, 
Um, I've watched a few of his videos to understand the terminology he's using. For instance, something that simply calls it simplex or something like that. He has this whole vocabulary speak. And in my opinion, I would say, Ken, pull back, relax a little bit, try to speak more in common terms that people know. When you have a vocabulary like that, there's two things that can happen that are, are bad. One, a person's gonna be like, well, I'll just watch what he's doing and that's pretty cool and then I'll go on. Uh, the second one is if you get involved with it, you get involved in, in the system, into the vocabulary, you end up sometimes concentrating more on the vocabulary and the system of that vocabulary than what's happening. So you wanna make sure you're not using all these terms that yes i know you're describing a three-dimensional space what it is the actual uh, uh words for it that's great but you want to pull back and say what am i doing Are, I, i'm lost when he speaks like that is he trying to show he's got a model for this he's got a systematic explanation for it um is it the case that um you know, his explanation, his words that he's using is going, is saying, I can predict this and here's why. Um, there's a lot of systems out there, but the, I'm always myself to let you know, me, David D. Hilser, as a science woke person, I'm looking really for one thing. Is this going to give me a clue to the physicality of the way the universe works? And certainly what he's showing there and what he's showing with light, um, um, the LED lights, the magnet, uh, and then he's got this really, I think he's sandwiched between two pieces of glass, some uh, liquid that is, reacts to magnetic fields because it has like small uh, metal particles in it or something like that. That's super interesting to me. But again, when he gets all this vocabulary there, um, it's almost like go back and read my Oh, it's like, oh, yes, oh, read the tome, get the vocabulary. And when you get, I'm not poo-pooing his, calm down. I'm not poo-pooing that he is not doing this right. But the way it's presented, it sort of sounds like when you walk into some type of church and you're hearing all this jargon and everybody's talking in the jargon and you don't know what they're talking about. I think physics can stay grounded, can stay with the common sense of all of us. It can ex be explained in the common sense. And if it doesn't, you're going to have to really, really convince somebody why they, that can't be. Because the idea is, if you can't, my, I remember I was in architecture school, got my a double degree in master's, uh, um, uh, bachelor's in mathematics and architecture. My architecture teacher always said, if you're mom can't understand the big idea of your building then it's a bad idea so again that's voc listen to the vocabulary man i'm lost well i'm not real lo as lost because i watched it and i i read uh him and i've seen other videos i watched other of his videos and i get where he's getting these vocabularies but my goodness if you fall upon this it's like what's this guy speaking uh um, Klingon, it sounds like. Again, fantastic. I love this setup. My dad and I are going to talk about it, but maybe tomorrow he's coming over. Use the illumination. Right now the ferro cell isn't even turned on. By turned on, I mean all you're doing is shooting a light across the cell itself. But this uh, less than one micron thin, now you can only see this if you actually have one of these. When you hold it in your hands, you'll actually see holographic depth that is 10 times deeper than the richest true art hologram you've ever held. Most people have actually never seen a true art hologram. And this is the second I'll turn the ferro cell on. Now here you can see the uh, dielectric inertial plane of the magnet. No one has actually ever seen this uh, before other than the inventor. Just using a regular flashlight, you can actually see the lines right there. Now let me turn the ferro cell on and show you the real magic, how it was meant to be used, but just showing that any light you know, the unit doesn't even have to be plugged in to work. It's like, okay, I'm in the car, or my kids are in the car. Discovering the nature of magnetism, it's like, well, you know, i got nowhere to plug the ferro cell. You don't need a ferro cell. I mean, don't need to plug it in anywhere. It's not even plugged in right now. All you need is a flashlight or one of these little LEDs. 
Now the neat thing happens is when you get an ultraviolet one of these LEDs or a blue one of these LEDs, I'll show you that in another video. Let me plug it in here and turn off the lights. And I'll show you the neat stuff that you can see. Here you can see the bloom pattern. Now I need to wipe off the ferrule cell because I got my grubby little hands on there. It's kind of like grabbing your the glasses, the lenses on the glasses that you're wearing. I had there we go. You'll see the bloom pattern appear in a second. Okay. In just a second, I'll show you a ring magnet. Right now, I'm using a three-quarter inch uh, cylinder magnet. If you were to have this in your hands, you're like, oh, well, that's pretty, pretty, that's pretty neat. It's like, no, I can't even show you with a video what this looks like in person. If you actually get your eyes down, you know, at a deep angle and look into it, you'll actually see true holographic depth. But what you're looking at is something that is less than one micron thin that is uh, letting the field of divergence and convergence show up. Here you see the dielectric inertial plane. Here you see the hyperboloid. You're actually seeing a very thin slice into the cross-section of the secret of Mother Nature. And like I said, 100% of the universe uh, and volume is so due only to magnetism. Magnetism is force in motion. It is the loss of inertia, which gives volume from the atomic scale at the micro to the macro scale. You know, we're talking about. Okay. Um, first of all, again, it's fascinating. A, a couple of things that I see here. Um, number one, I think what he's talking about in the holographic, uh, that it's one micron thick, is that... Um, between the two pieces of glass it's one micron thick but he's seeing in 3d something that looks like it's going beyond that well to me what that means is that each eye is going to see a different uh view uh, of something and that's going to cause a 3d effect is it really 3d no the 3d effect comes from our eyes seeing two uh two views of it now i'm a little confused on whether or not he thinks that's that 3D effect is actually somehow real in the, I, I, I don't know. To me, it's an optical illusion. It doesn't mean, I don't mean that in a, in a bad way, uh, but I'm sure it's beautiful to look at. And uh, yes, I have seen holograms. Uh, basically all they do is their ability to give each eye at a different angle. Uh, you get to see a different picture from that. Uh, holograms are sort of all encoded in a, in a holistic way. Um, my father and I have our model. We have not dealt with holograms yet. But so that's the first point. Um, then he starts talking about a couple of things that magnetism runs the entire universe. I, 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 according to him, to me, that would be close to an electric universe type of idea. Um, my father and I's model has actually gravity and electricity we just say gravity and gravity is simply um, random particles flying around uh, uh, whereas electricity light magnetism not a lot light electricity magnetism um, electromag uh, um, uh, electrons that go around atoms those kinds of things that are just flowing particles that flow together so uh, it depends on your model so what I, what I read from this is that Ken Wheeler says that he can describe everything with that. Um, I've heard some of his descriptions for gravity. They seem somewhat vague to me. Um, and um, that would be another. In general, I'm getting, if we were to sit or if we were to give a talk even to our group, I think that vagueness would be qu not questioned. Would we get, want to get answers from him? because there's a lot of vocabulary, and yes, he has a big vocabulary. Yes, I have a master's in linguistics, uh, okay? So, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to communicate your ideas. Language is something we use that we see all the five inputs that we have. Uh, it goes into this brain. The neural network makes connections. We use language, which we've developed over the years, so that I see connections in the universe. He does when he looks at his stuff. He then translates them to words. Those words go out of his mouth into your ears, which you know that language, and then that tries to recreate something in your head. Now, it does me no good or he no good if we're talking speak. That doesn't 
that gets to our ears and we can't translate it. So as much as a person has that vocabulary, again, I would say we need to talk in terms that are going to be understood. Dr. Karazani, my mentor, he couldn't explain what he said. He only talked in mathematics and I and people asked me what it was, I said I could, didn't know. It took me four or five years for me to understand that what he said was, oh, Einstein's special relativity is wrong because in the calculations for relativity you have two frames. There aren't two frames in the universe. There's only one three-dimensional space and all you can do is move the origin. When you do measurements, I had to come up with that explanation. But if he were to explain it and you listen to him, he would explain it. But it wouldn't be that way and un understood. Uh, the other, the third thing he talks about, and I do remember this quite, quite well, is this lack of inertia. So when he's talking about the lack of inertia, um, I would say, what is inertia? What is inertia? What's the physicality of what you say inertia is? Again, he's using these words and vocabularies, and I want him to pin it down. I want, I want to, I sort of like want to put his shoulders against the wall and say, "A lack of inertia. What is inertia? Tell me what inertia is, because if it's that important that you say it's the lack of that does these things in his model, I need to know what it is. So what I'm hearing a lot of are explanations in a system, but I can never find the ground. It's almost like I'm floating in space and I need for me to understand you, what your theory is, what your model is, what your viewpoint of how the world works, what the universe works. I need you to put my feet onto solid ground. And that's what I don't get when he have, makes these station, these statements he makes and he repeats them. Now, I'm not saying that in his mind he doesn't have a system. What I'm saying in, in his mind, he, he's got these, this great experiment going on right there. And it's absolutely fascinating. I think this is great. But the lack of inertia, well, you got to explain what inertia is. Go watch, um, go look at Particle Guru Inertia. My dad talks about inertia. But he, he talks about it in a way that's physical and that you know, pretty much anybody understands, it's not like the lack of it, and then talks about that's how this happens. And the person's like, well, what? <laughs> tell me what inertia is in your model before you even tell me what the lack of it is. And those explanations, if what happens if you learn to speak of him, and so that if you have all the people together who like his work and they all speak that, that's great. But do they, when you pin them down and say, tell me what it really is in layman's terms. Well, you, you don't, you just got to be around him long enough to, it's a speak, it becomes more religious like. And I'm not saying he is wrong about any of this. I'm saying the way he's talking about it. He's got, he needs a person like myself or someone else to sit down, put all this feet on the ground so that anybody who is listening can understand the, the things that he's talking about. And if, and if people tell you about their theory that you just have to really study it really hard because it's really complicated, I agree with Dr. Alexander Unsker. That's, and I have a meme out that says that as, as many of you've seen that before. The universe is not complicated, our, our theories are. And that's that shouldn't be that way. But again, I am, making these comments first of all this is fantastic i love ken wheeler i love what he's doing how he's communicating it it could be a lot better for sure but this is fantastic stuff when i hear the explanation i'm not even though i've watched some of these other things going on i understand sort of what he's saying but Either someone else has to do it for him or he has to do it. Karazani had somebody like me to come along and put it into words what he was doing. My father and I's goal since the beginning is nothing we talk about can be that way. It's just we don't allow it. You know, if someone says, what is light? Well, light are G1 particles that come to you in waves of particles. They all travel together. It's not a f one photon cannot be light. Uh, light only comes in waves and waves of particles. They all travel together. Um, meaning, you know, I can tell you that gravity, that's just everything. Electricity, what is that? G1 particles flowing together. That's it. What's magnetism? G1 particles flowing like this. 
am I right? Am I wrong? Am my dad right? Am I wrong? No, that's what I'm saying. But I can explain it to the average person. Like, oh, that's pretty cool. I get that. So again, if you're under the impression, one of the problems we have in dissident science, one of the big problems we have in mainstream science, forget that, forget it. I, I, I take that back. Strike what I just said. It's not in dissident science. What Ken Wheeler doing is doing here is absolutely fantastic. I love his work. If someone says, well, you know Ken Wheeler now? He says, yep, love his work. Uh, you know, knowing what he's doing in his explanations, uh, I don't know enough. I can't, I understand what he's sort of saying, but I'm not getting grasp of where my he wants my feet to land other than there's a system he sort of sees in his head. But as for this kind of thing going on, phew, this is great. Most likely, if this turns out to be something really interesting and really revealing about the way the universe does work, um, because right now, it may be the case that my dad and I's model can explain you know, what he's doing there, and that's great, that's fine, models have to do that. But if it actually reveals something else, like the Denou effect, where you see flows together, attract flows apart that bash into each other, uh, uh, repel, it could end up having the Wheeler effect. This could end up being called the Wheeler effect, and you better be able to explain it in your model. You know, maybe that's what this will be. I don't know, but regardless, uh, hats off to to uh, Ken. So. I hope I'm not, again, I'm not here to destroy. I'm trying to be honest about it, and that's why I talked about all this in the beginning. All right, folks, let's keep going forward. Again, this is fascinating. So right now what I think I see are two plates of, of glass together. You have a magnetic field. Uh, you have light, and then you have a magnet on top of it that this, this fluid in between, which is one micron, is producing interference patterns uh, and uh, with different wavelengths, he says he gets different things. And it turns out what he says is you have, uh, just like you, we see things uh, in 3D when we look at a reflection in a mirror, and there obviously isn't a, a real object in on that face of the mirror, but we see it, you do see a 3D effect here. Now, again, I don't know what his claim is on that, but that's what I'm borrowing it, uh, looking at it now. And sure enough, you can see you know, just like if you put shavings there. In my opinion, this is just the same. This is just a cooler way to do the shavings. You know, the the, the shavings thing. So, where you put the the filings, the metal filings down, and then a magnet on top of that, and you see the patterns go on, on that. Let's keep going. The stars and planets and whatnot. Here you can see the dielectric inertial plane. Let me stop pressing against the table, so I keep moving my magnet. My magnet wants to roll because I keep pressing on the table. You see the straight lines here along the midsection of the magnet. That's the dielectric inertial plane. And uh, the hyperboloids that are actually coming out. What is forming on the outside of this magnet is a torus, a donut, reciprocating centrifugally and centripetally. Let me put the magnet underneath. Here you can see right here. Okay. Very, very simple. It does come with the bottom plate. I have it off camera right now. That also does come with the ferro cell. So if you want to drop a magnet inside there, let me lift it up a bit so you can see it. You'll see a uh, sunflower-like pattern. This is absolutely fantastic. I, I just, <laughs> this is fantastic. One of the things my dad did was to set, um, you know, the, the, the old little magnets, the old little compasses around a, a magnet. Turns out the batteries do the same thing. I have to tell him. Tell, someone tell Ken um, to, instead of putting a ba um, uh, magnet there, put a battery there. Turns out that batteries have the same uh, field. G1 particles are captured inside, which is we, we call electricity, electrons, whatever you want to call it. But those are sort of vague terms. Uh, and they are positive and negative. We don't believe in that. There's particles. So the particles of G1 particles are what we call G1 particles, or particles of that we call electricity. Those things are flowing around um, a battery as well. And so the same, you know, in, in, in my opinion, the same particles. But look at this. This is like you can see the really complex stuff. You don't have to put shavings down, and you don't have to do all this stuff. This should be like an apparatus. You should sell this. 
That's what you should do. You should make them and sell them or put a kit of how to do this because this will let us really, because one of the things my dad and I have been trying to do is like, what happens to the field because we're trying to describe our particle flow. See all of these things here. Uh, you can't see my mouse. I don't think I don't have my mouse activated in this. Can I do that? Uh, it doesn't matter. But anyways, you see that sunflower and all that stuff. Um, you know, those represent uh, the part, you know, particle flows. And so uh, and in, in the lines they have, in my opinion, they're not, I, I'm not sure if those are lines or like those are the fixed lines or those just happen to be because of the way the light's coming out that they gather up and the interference comes that way. I don't know. Uh, but this is just fantastic all this this is like you can put magnets here and get all those fields there and this will help with our model when we're trying to model what's happening inside metal metal atoms why do why is metallic atoms do these kinds of things why do they keep the flow of g1 part or electrons or whatever you want to call them particles flowing around why do they do that and i and my my, my contention all along is that metal has a property that it funnels these things. Just like if you were to line up a bunch of suns and shoot comets through, those comets would stay on its path through it and be guided through it. That's the kind of thing, it's, that's actually how our model works. But this is fantastic. I love this, it's like cool. Let me see here if anybody has comments. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes, we do. Uh, lack of inertia comes often with Keeler Magnus, and he did explain what he means by inertia in this video. He did 2,000 magnet, mag, magnetism video, 5,000 total. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, that's how many videos he has. Um, I'm going to go back here and see how many videos does he have. Oh, about. Oh, it doesn't say. It's, it says at the home. How many videos does this dude have? Usually it says. Okay. I'm going to go back. Oh, where did it go? Oh, I think it was this one. Yeah. Video, what, what this, this looks, looks like in person. person. If you, you actually get, get your, your eyes down, down, you know, at a deep angle along the midsection, Google means being thrown outwards. There we go. People say, oh, you use such big terms. Like, these aren't big terms, really. <laughs> you just need to expand your vocabulary a little bit. Centrifugal means being thrown out. Centripetal means like sucking back in, okay? Returning like uh, water down a drain pipe. Right here, the central part right there, that's the centripetal. The uh i understand he's trying to use the vocabulary and 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 this is why um can anybody remember uh, I, I asked this question before um does anybody remember who were the people that put plus and minus for the first time anybody i'll let you know but basically um so i understand what he's saying but you know remembering which one is which i mean you know, I, I think I think to me it's it's really you know it's important it's flowing yeah these are flowing out these are flowing in, and it may be not even important at this point which ones are flowing out if it is he goes okay these these are flowing out of the magnet these are flowing into the magnet whatever that is um, because you know it's like centripetal and centrifugal yeah you I guess well you know maybe maybe. Yeah, people get it, and that's what they're going to use, and, and that become a, a vocabulary. Okay, maybe. Drain point where the loss of inertia from the other side comes around, and right there, right in the center. This is the only way Mother Nature knows how to work. Mother Nature is not a cross-eyed hooker on crack with a calculator. That sounds funny, but I'm being very literal because that has how modern science betrays nature. If he's talking about quantum mechanics, he's absolutely right. Um, it's they're they're making it super complicated. So uh, I agree with that. I'm starting to understand uh, a little bit of his speak for sure. Nature only knows one thing: 
force in motion and inertia and acceleration. Inertia and the loss of inertia. And uh, for a hundred dollars, like I said, I am not selling anything. I don't make a damn dime if he sells two of these or a hundred of these. I kid you not. You know you can believe me because I don't make a dime dime. For a hundred dollars teaching, some, every classroom should have one of these. I feel like a fool, don't I? That's what I said a while back, huh? Duh. I actually submitted this uh, video um, to one of the producers of uh, Amazing Outrageous Acts of Science. It's a TV show. They have all these uh, self-righteous uh, uh, professors and uh, physicists on there. Why don't you try to have one of them explain this? Oh, they can't do it. It's impossible. You think, oh, that's not very impressive. Do you know there's nothing here other than some hardware LEDs and my friend's invention, the ferro cell, which is two super optically flat, you can't use sheet glass, okay, super optically flat pieces of glass between it is a special, it's called a magic mixture of ferrofluid and some other stuff that lets you see magnetism as it really is. It lets you see the centrifugal divergence in the center. And instead of paying $450, for the large cell, this one's 62 millimeters. So let you see everything. Let me show you something really neat. Now I can't see in the dark, so I have to turn on the flashlight. It's like, where's that magnet at? There it is. Grab it, place it over the R, and come back here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a ring magnet on top, and let's see what happens. I should have used the macro lens for this, but if you can get in really close, what what you'll actually see forming. Is a per perfect uh, a toroidal ball right in the center. So you'll actually see a uh, toroidal and a hyperboloidic uh, force uh, force vector and uh, counterspatial sink right there. So inside the hole of the ring magnet, we have another hole of centripetal convergence. Now, see, this is something you need to think about. You need to pause this and put your put some uh, oil on the gears of your brain. Okay. Inside this donut, we've got another donut, okay? The ring magnet's a donut. It's a physical donut. But inside that physical donut, well, I'm using the term hole very, very loosely here. Inside the middle of this hole, we have another hole where uh, the magnet complaining, well, they weren't complaining. It's like, oh, my God, I would desperately like to have, you know, the huge feral cell, but it's $450, and I just don't have the money. Well, this one's 60 Now, do I sound like a pitch man? Yes. Well, there's two types of pitch man, okay? There's a pitch man that is selling something to you, and there's a pitch man that's going like, oh, my God, there are these donuts down the street, and they are just awesome. I mean, they're just the most awesome donuts to just makes me want to melt with excitement. That's a different type of pitch, man. That's like a person that says, this is awesome. You need to check this on these is high. If I told you what he's actually making on these, he cares more. The inventor of this device is a true humanitarian, and I mean that. He's an awesome guy. Okay, so, um, you know, just hats off to this guy for you know coming up a way to make like he said you can see magnetism a lot easier this is great because one of the things that my father and i with our our model we were trying to figure out well how do we see these things so maybe we will purchase one of these for uh working with our model now again the loss of, the inertia part i need to understand i i don't i don't understand what the basis of his his universe is is it what does his does is somebody here who knows ken wheeler what does what is a magnetic field made of what is it um can someone in the in here tell me by the last way the missing important element einstein's idea let's see plus or minus refers to a missing component relating to capacitance you're going layman on us dave damn I don't know what that means. I'm going layman on you. I'm not sure. Um, anyways, uh, I, I'm not really sure myself uh, what the underlying, I, I'll have to look at that, his uh, stuff. It's sort of like, well, you know, the electric universe, people talk about electric, everything's electric, electric, electric fields, 
but I never hear them talk about what that is. And if it is, you know, that's why I said, well, there you've got ether, you've got um, grid, uh, lattice, you have particle models. What is it? Is the, you know, what's going on there? What's what is the elect electric field? Why is there positive and negative? There's dipoles and monopoles. Why do things attract? What makes them actually attract and what makes them not attract? Is it the case that Ken Wheeler is is sort of an electric field where he's that's not interesting for him, right? Or I don't know what his explanation for that is, because uh, uh, when you have a model like. Burkert's ether model or our particle model, we have infinity, meaning there's never a case where you have one sort of thing that makes the whole universe. It's, it's, there's particles and particles have parts and those parts have parts infinitely down and infinitely up. And so, you know, you have to have sort of a system that works in, in, in the levels of infinity and you know, I don't know enough about Ken Wheeler stuff, but I'll, I'll try to check it out more um, now that, you know, you guys have pointed him out and what he's doing. Uh, you know, I think this uh, apparatus he have is, is great. It's really, like I said, it's a great apparatus to look at magnetism. Now, you know, what he's claiming about it with his inertia. Uh, inertia is basically the idea is if something is moving, it's got an inertia, right? And he's saying, well, it loses inertia. Well, the way I would say it is that it starts to orbit or curve. Anytime you have a curve, you have to have something hitting it to make it curve. Uh, we have gravitational fields, which are basically, you know, just particles in all directions. You put things in the way of that, it causes pressure differentials, but it's all always hits. You know, if you've got and if we look at Wheeler's stuff with our just give you a perspective of what I'm talking about. Our model would say that what's happening is the, the particles that are going around, we call G1 particles, they're going around. And the reason they make curves at all is because there's a gravity one level below of G2 particles that are at a, a, a level down below that. And it's just like if you bop down and say that now we're looking at that as a, as a universe model, as a solar system model, as a galaxy model, what you would have is uh, electrons and those electrons would be like planets and the things that make planets stay around the sun um, are, are in our particle model called particles and the particle has a, are a bunch of little ones and they're gravity and they hit on the earth and that and the sun and there's this this effect from uh, simply uh, uh, mass hitting other mass same thing happens down at the uh, atomic level so and and at the magnetic level so all those curves and all those lines you see are happening because of the g2 gravitational field there's just another field below that and below that there's another field and and the two things that happen in particles is that they have random fields and they cause orbiting and that's what you're seeing here it's just small particles g1 particles orbiting and you see the light off of it it's a different thing about explaining the whole thing but what we do is we have uh, an explanation it's not that it goes to the middle or it's losing inertia what's happening is that there's a field there and there are little particles called g2 particles that level down so if you were to go down like i said so those are the explanations and you know saying simply inertia I need to know the ne mechanism that he's explaining about. I know what in inertia is. Uh, most of us who study physics do. It's like I said, body in motion will stay in motion. And when it comes at you and it hits you, it's got a force. And um, yes, if it loses that, then, uh, you know, well, maybe then. Is he talking about like a gr gravitation? So the Earth is losing its inertia. Therefore, oh, 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 that's why it spirals in. So what he's what he's saying to me is that he's describing it, saying it's inertia. Losing of inertia would be like the Earth's losing its inertia, and if it did, it would spiral into the um, sun. So in the middle of a donut magnet, <coughs> those lines are losing inertia. Therefore, that's why he's explaining it. But he's not saying what's causing that loss, uh, that inertial loss. So. All right, something dropped. All righty.
Well, I appreciate everybody uh, sticking around with me on this. Um, plus and minus only refers to a missing component relating to capacitance. I am a noob. Um, plus and minus is our way of making things attract and repel. Benjamin Franklin is the answer. For those who didn't know, he was the first to come up with the idea of plus and minus in our world, and that stuck like glue in science. But uh, according to numerous new models of the universe, like our model, we have no plus and minus. Things attract and repel because of particle flow, um, and magnets have particle flow. Metal keeps magnet. When you magnetize a magnet, you're just getting electron. What mainstream would call it electrons, you would call it electrons. We call it a different particle because it's it's a particle that's more generic. It does a lot more, and it just goes around and captures that. Uh, so uh, all the things that we describe, we describe this. We have to. That's a funny. If you don't have plus and minus, Dave, and you don't have like positive negative charge, that's impossible. Yeah, no, we can just we have to describe the whole universe. So um, that's you know the positive negative is a system. It isn't the way the universe works, though. I read an article about the MC square, an important element. Um, you're going layman on us. Tell me what that means. Uh, I posted links above to others to one of uh, the Pharaoh videos, which are amazing. Yep, those are, those are are quite amazing. Um, like I said, I probably want to. My dad and I will. Hey, Dad, you give fifty bucks, I'll give fifty bucks, and we'll go buy it. We're not rich people, but Ken is anti gravity. Ask Ken. He is. I answer. He, he a nice guy. Okay. He's a nice guy. Ken is anti-gravity. I would imagine what you're stating there is he says gravity comes from the electric or from magnetism. So he's, that's exactly the thing, that's exactly the same as the electric universe. Um, I'm, I believe that magnetism and gravity are just simply different behaviors of uh, the same thing. So in that sense, is it simpler model? Maybe, maybe our model's simpler, I don't know. So I think that's what you're meaning is that he believes everything's magnetic to us. Magnetism is the same as electricity, is the same as electromagnetism, which is, uh, I mean, electro magnetic fields. So I get it, that's what he says, no problem. Oh, okay. So I'm getting a correction for him. Nothing isn't as, as it seems. He's not against, he's against the classic definition. Oh yeah, I remember reading it. He is against the classic, uh, I would uh, argue, I would, I guess I would agree with him if he's talking about the gravitational equations that Newton came up with. But I think if Newton were alive and he was in front of me and Ken, he would say, no, um, you're not against what I put down. Um, I myself was looking for the ultra mundane corpuscle. Newton was, or as his uh, immediate people after Newton were looking for that. And what it was? It was a graviton. So he was already looking for a real force. Newton said something very profound and very important that makes me admire him greatly. Newton says, don't ever accuse me of understanding what gravity is. My equations just describe what how bodies in it react. And so that's why I think, you know, Ken's argument is he's got great stuff. I, I think a lot of his explanations are really interesting. A lot of his vocabulary, I'm starting getting a, a, a feel for it. But that kind of explanation, um, I'm not sure is the best one. Uh, I, I know what he's saying. Um, he's saying, well, sort of. Yeah. Um, okay, gravity is magnetism. Okay. Uh, Ken thinks gravity is magnetism. So gravity is electric. 
That's uh, according to everything I know about all the models out there. That's what I would say. You can say it's magnetism, but in our model, magnetism is the same as electric, the same as that. Um, and again, he's going to have to give us a physicality to what magnetism is. So it's the same way with elect the electric universe. They say it's all electric fields. Then I say, what's electric field? So, and again, nothing against it. This is uh, fantastic stuff. <laughs> well, I duplicate. Uh, I am absolutely agree with you that he would not agree with that. But no matter what a person says, I have to look at what the person is meaning. I don't care that they say they're not. I have to look at it according to what I can see. And what I see is if he does not subscribe to the gravitonic model of gravity, meaning things do not orbit because of random particles. You've got particles in the universe. We know that. We've got suns in the universe. If you looked at every sun as a particle, if you looked at our solar system as an atom and the nucleus as the sun, whatever you want to do, we have particles. If particles fly in all directions, like this air around me, and I make a wave through it, that would be an ether type of model. If I have all these, this, um, all these particles in our solar system and our and the galaxy, and they're traveling in all directions, there's a thing called the shadowing effect. That shadowing effect is what causes uh, what many people call gra gravity, and that's gravitons. It's called the shadowing effect. So that's that's good. Uh, that's one idea. But if, gra if you have gravity you ha uh, as from magnetism, you have to tell me what magnetism is. So I need to know that. So it's sort of, I'll be honest with you, this is my take, okay? David DeHilcher's opinion, please do not take this as uh, you need to believe this. But my own opinion is, okay? And being around lots of models, being around, you know, people like uh, Ken, uh, brilliant minds come up with really cool things love it even the vocabulary working a lot of things they're saying may be um, correct but they're maybe saying it in a more convoluted way um, I say that I told you in one of my videos ether is a light biased model which people try to try to stick gravity into Electric fields or magnetic fields are one aspect of the universe, but they're not the only aspect of the universe. And again, our model, my father and I's model, sort of shows that. There's, if there's only particles in the world, there's only mass and not mass. There's space and there's mass in space. The only thing it does is travel in straight lines. The only thing you can do is hit each other. The only way you can get things to orbit is to constantly hit something to make it do that or have a pressure, a bunch of hits on one side being greater than on the other side. I just don't see, I see that as just a natural uh, outcome. So from me, ether is light biased. Try to stick gravity into it. Magnetic and electric fields are electric biased trying to stick gravity into it and in reality i think if you look at the particle world and the universe's particles they're both there one's random one flows together that's it and in fact the same particle is responsible and in, in, in our model the way it shows it is it's it's same particles responsible for gravity light magnetism electricity all of it the only difference is the electric part is flowing together particles that go together and flows and you get magnetism that kind of stuff. and the things that make things orbit is the shining effect i that's the way i i see it because of, uh, 
I, I can't reconcile that you have to shove everything into magnetism. You have to shove everything even to gravity. And that didn't, that's what was happening with gravitons. And I wasn't buying the gravitonic model. I wasn't buying the electric universe model. I wasn't bu buying the, uh, the magnetic model. I wasn't buying the ether model until my dad came along and said, wait a minute, light is, can be described with particles moving together in waves of waves of particles like waves of bombers when he did that all of a sudden all of these things came together in what we are working on the particle model so i i don't that's what makes me back off from people who say oh everything's electric oh everything's graviton and so that's my take on it yeah i understand gravity is just a different modality of magnetism i understand the idea i even understand um dr lucas um dr w lucas you want to see an equation that will simply fry your mind um and i understand his explanation of what gravity is to him it's it's it happens at a, a at a, 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 a subatomic level i understand that but he doesn't explain what those fields are either but he explains that so you can say that it's part of magnetism but you've got to give me a, a physical explanation for that that's all i want gotta see if i find that equation that lucas that equation will blow your mind but yeah i understand the statement i want it to be explained other than just words i want you to describe the physical thing that's happening to me blow by blow because that's what i look for and maybe i'm just a mechanical a, a, an ancient 16th century 17th century industrial revolution guy who made a pipe organ out of a, a, a vacuum cleaner uh, old vacuum cleaner fishing line inner uh, bicycle inner tubes and clothespins and i want everything to be um uh for you you know everything to be mechanical in the world and so maybe i'm, I'm stuck in that my dad and i are, are mechanistic and require that the universe be physical and maybe it's not maybe it's mystical I don't like it. I don't like it. But um, Lucas, oh my gosh, it's coming up to an hour and a half. Won't go on too much longer. Uh, let's see. D -d 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 I have one of his papers that's, oh, I know. I'll go to full papers. I'm not showing you this because I don't like browsing around for people to, uh, full papers. Here we go. I think there's one by. Well, maybe I can get it from his force equation books and just show you. Does he have it in here? This is a, an amazing model. This is when you, if you were to take the current model that we have today and you, oh, here you go. There you go. Pretty cool. Ah, there, yeah. He's talking about. And then there's the the math for it right down below, curls and two Q's and an R squared. Oh, it looks like gravity equations, which is really the electromagnetic stuff. Absolutely great stuff. And he comes up with a, for, a universal force equation. He uses toroids. And there's how they're set up. It's a great, it's, I love his stuff. Even gets it down to neon. There's a neon atom. You know, people have to come up with their explanations for it, but their, their equations and everything, you know, that, that are, are, are that they come up with are great but when it comes down to me then in the end it's like that is great all these toroids but how do they stay where they are 
What keeps them in their place? What is it? So, zoom, 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 bump, bump. Way beyond my comprehension. <laughs> it's way beyond a lot of people's comprehension, for sure. Okay, all right. Well, here, I didn't have to read the whole thing. He's saying, gravity is just a different modality of magnetism that we have yet to explain and define. My contention is no. Gravity is just a different behavior of particles, the same particles. So, just disagree with that. That's okay. But see, what I'm saying is, is that when you have to fit it in, if you make the statement that magnetism, that gravity has to be part of magnetism because you're so enthralled with magnetism, you're so enthralled with the fields of magnetic fields that you can now see with this great apparatus that Ken makes, you're falling in love with it. So you're now imbuing everything that falls under magnetism. I you're, you're falling in love with it. Fools don't want to fall in love with it. Again, Ken Wheeler is has a hundred percent of my respect. He has a hundred percent of my respect. Keep doing what you're doing, Ken. Keep going at it. Um, I'm telling you my opinion about it, and the only reason I may have somewhat of a bigger picture is because I spent a lot of time with a lot of different people with a lot of different models. And when you work on your stuff only, and you, like, if I were, my father and I would only work on what we have, and we don't, we didn't look at Yonel Danu, we didn't look, look at Borkut's work, we didn't look at um, uh, Karazani's work, we'd probably be nowhere. Well, we would be nowhere. And then when we go to conferences and we see something, and we see something like what Ken Wheeler's doing with this apparatus, this ferro magnet or whatever it is, this apparatus that shows this is fantastic. My dad, my, if I think if I show my dad tomorrow, he's coming in tomorrow uh, morning at my house here. He lives pretty close. I'm going to show him this. He's going to be like, let's get one. <laughs> but if you are, elect, you think the universe is more electric, that is great. Well, what happens when you then say everything has to come out of it? Oh, I think light is has is waves and ether that is oh that is so fantastic well gravity has to be part of that why especially when we have a model the particle model by de hilster de hilster that shows we can do the all of that with the same particle no the particle is identical light gravity magnetism electricity the electron all the same they're all the same particle one particle and it's just by the way they travel in randomness or all together is the only difference that model is a simpler model so again my own David D. Hilser's perspective is that people find one thing and then try to fit it all into that feral cell is the website you can buy from yay uh, we'll end up getting one, I'm sure. <laughs> it's a rate of induction, Ken says, but but that is without a cording from... Okay, when, when, when... It's a rate of induction, Ken says, but that is without accounting for... I want to know the physicality in the end. That's all. That's all I'm really wanting to know. I think that's why my dad and I have been working on our model for a while. And I think what's appealing to me about it is it just gives a physicality for every darn gosh darn thing. We can tell you exactly what it is, why, what's its behavior, and why it does what it does. And then when you go one step below that, we say there's another step, there's another level of the universe below that. And it does it. We've even got to the G3 level at one time, but we only have to go a couple levels right now. But that that's why that's why my father and I are, are so fascinated with working on what we're working on. 
because we're just tired of talk. I can understand, I mean, I can understand these equations, right? I understand this guy's brilliant models. His predictive powers for the subatomic world are just incredibly better than uh, mainstream physics. It's a way better system. He's got a, a ring toroid model. Is it an ether? That's what I want to know. It is, it is great. I think it's great. But Dave D. Hilster, me, and I think the average person out there is going to say, just tell me what it is. Now, if we know what it is, then we can supposedly manipulate it, right? That's the idea. Planck, Planck equation says all light reflects is equal. All of, them re, all of them reflect. And science proved daily that this statement is math is wrong. <laughs> well, remember, we can't prove anything. We have evidence for and against and support, not support, but... Anyways, um, I greatly appreciate people staying here. If you have any more questions, let me know, but I'm going to probably be wrapping it up here. Um, again, um, in the bigger picture, we got to support each other. People were calling Ken names and all that stuff. That's just, it's not childlike. I don't care what, you know, everybody has emotion. I have emotion when I hear people talk about you know, or even when inertial reduction, it's like, tell me what that is. I don't want to know. I know what that is conceptually. What is it in the physical universe? You know, but I don't sit there and say, Ken, you're an idiot. No, Ken's a brilliant guy. I can see that. Otherwise, why would so many people be listening to him? I just want you to be careful not to get seduced, folks. Don't get seduced into thinking the universe is one thing or one behavior. Uh, there seems to be numerous behaviors in the universe. And yeah, there may be only a few. Maybe there's only flow and randomness. And you can describe everything with that. But regardless, don't think it's all magnetism. Don't think it's all light. Don't think it's all gravity. Don't think that light, light models who are specifically good at light are going to necessarily going to be able to fit gravity in. You're, you're like... Oh, I've got this. Um, see, the entire universe is um, a hexagon. And this is magnetism. And this is gravity. But it's, it's round. But we haven't figured that out yet. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know, ether... Ethers tries to fit in gravity. Um, Dr. Lucas tries to fit in gravity. And magnetism now is trying to fit in gravity. And the electric universe is trying to fit in gravity. Um, I don't like that. I don't like the fitting in. I think that's trying to force an idea you fell in love with to try to, you know, I don't know what the answer, well, we have a, an answer to that. I think there will be other answers to that. Maybe we will. Maybe you'll find it. Maybe they'll find what goes on. But I think it's going to be really hard if there's no physicality in, behind it. Glenn Borkert is, is uh, the person I talk about all the time in Infinity Guy, uh, Scientific Worldview. Uh, he has an ether model that's infinity. He's the guy who came up with that. I didn't come up with that. I mean, our model doesn't have infinity because of what we thought because I believe that to be true. I don't think you have magical particles at the bottom of the universe that magically <laughs> magically organize themselves with random with random, you know, plus and minuses or whatever it is. Uh, you can't have the universe which is somewhat organized uh, accidentally happen from a single particle that everything's made out of because how do those single particles know to do what? If they have, then they have pieces and brains inside of them, which means they're smaller and there's smaller particles inside of them. So that's why infinity is important. But again, what I would say is, you know, Ken Wheeler, I'm going to watch his stuff now. I'm going to subscribe to him. And when he comes out with more stuff, I'm going to look at it. You know, I'll hear more about his explanations. But again, 
those are my that's my take on it and congratulations and if you are if any of you are following him great continue to follow him. like i said i'm going to subscribe to him um I, i'm not here to say he's wrong in anything i mean he could be right about everything he's saying he could be right that uh, gravity is part of magnetism um again i'm not so satisfied with just the words of saying that or that it hasn't been found i still have a step before that is what does magnetism in the physical world mean but if you are following him and you are being enlightened by him and you are becoming a critical thinker and saying hey we got to look at the universe in different ways and uh yeah and you can ed, you can entertain that the big bang is wrong you can entertain the idea that perhaps relativity is wrong uh, you can entertain the idea that we need to throw out most of particle physics since 19, starting in 1930 since they've been inventing particles and pretending to follow them follow them if you can intent, entertain that you can entertain the idea that the earth and other bodies are actually growing in mass and that there's a lot of data that supports that if you can entertain those ideas you are becoming science woke or are science woke and you're critical thinkers but if you can also keep an engineering attitude and not fall in love like my father and i who daily talk to each other on the phone says man this particle model we can't break it but it can't be that is this got to be wrong this is forget it this is we're, we're, we're nuts you got to keep that attitude folks we're the ones we know our problems with our models our particle model better than you do probably because because i'm trying to break it all the time i see p other people's particle models graviton models have problems um light models have pro all these things so all right any more questions yes no arp lives let's see here i am a dissident sky scholar nicely rips the standard model shreds yep he does um Will you cover Sky Scholar YouTube channel next week, Dave? Sure. I guess this is a good way to do this. I didn't think I, I had some form, but yeah, I will. I love Sky Scholar. I don't think he likes me at all, though. <laughs> I try to communicate with him. Love Sky Scholar. Guy start his channel at the same time as me, more be after it. But of course, he's got the Electric Universe people. I think he is. Isn't he Electric Universe guy? And so he's got a built-in 130. 120,000 people who would be interested in him pretty quickly. So he's like, his subscribership just blows mine out of the water. Shush, the secret classic science doesn't know him yet. The best science channel ever. Who says Steve Beck? Sky Scholar. Yeah, he's pretty good. It's pretty good. I don't know if he's the best i'm not trying to be the best i'm just trying to be the most um uh, open well the least biased maybe i think i think too too many of the channels come to you with this is the way it is and if you have a disagreement with that it's like you know i have no problem with, like i said um if magnetism rules the universe and gravity is part of it, it could be. I'm not sure. Uh, this, do you think Sky Scholar would say, yeah, maybe the electric universe is wrong? I'm not sure they would say that. But I will do it on him, and I love his stuff. I love it, I love it, I love it, because he, the electric universe, only a few years back, 10 years they weren't doing it, go, they weren't doing it. Now, you know, Sky Scholar has Stephen Crullers on. 10 years ago, Electric Universe wouldn't even worry, talk about that. I remember when they were at our conference, we did, we did joint conferences with them in Albuquerque and in Maryland. We did it two times. And they laughed at us for making fun of Einstein. You guys are hooked on Einstein. Guess what they're doing now? Arp, Halton Arp, he's a great. Yep. Oh, is that true? Is 90% of his photo. Yeah, he should. Hey, Ken, go put it on. You. Exactly. I agree with that. More liquid than electric. He was on Swiss Observatory in January. 
what if light travels uh, on a lattice and C particles ether slow? Yeah, it could be. That's another model, I guess. All of him and the best of the wish to him. That's it. But EU pretty much agrees with Ken's model. Yeah. Well, yeah. They both think, that's what I'm saying. Ken's model is an electric model, in my opinion. Alrighty, folks. You guys are sticking around, but I guess there are no more questions or comments. So I will see you later. Next week, I will talk on um, Sky Scholar. That would be fine. I'll make that my uh, mission. Uh, it says, I just uh, love how Robert, uh, Robert Tali explains the scientific facts and makes it easy to understand. Uh, mathematics explains step by step. His thermodynamic videos are just excellent. Yes. All right. Okay. Goodbye, folks. See you later. And like I said, don't take any of my word for any of this, really. Just stay critical. Stay thinking. I am David D. Hilser. I am your science therapist. A lot of you are becoming science woke or are science woke. I'm learning from you. I Congratulations, Ken uh, Wheeler. Great stuff. You're only to be applauded a thousand percent. Um, keep it up. Keep working. Keep working on your magnetism. Try to fit gravity into it. That is like uh, Dr. Alexander Unterker says, everybody work on your models. Keep pounding at it, but keep an open mind listen to the criticisms, listen to what people are saying, because if not, they're going to steal your idea, improve upon it, and go forward. My dad and I's model is a good example of that. You know, is it right? I don't know. Could be it. totally wrong. Ciao for now.